It's the day of love, and tonight we're showing our affection with an inside look at NASCAR Media Day. As Speed Weeks kick off, we're live in Daytona with everyone from Jimmy to Junior, Tony to Danica, and a pair that won't be sharing that special kiss. Yeah, we held hands and walked on the boat. And that was the one person that I definitely wanted to vacation with. Plus, with the engine still silent, we already know the winner of Saturday's Sprint Unlimited. It's a special two-hour edition of NASCAR Race Hub, and the Hub Love starts now. NASCAR Race Hub is presented by Mobile One. 65 years ago, NASCAR was formed on the beaches of Daytona. Not sure if Big Bill France ever dreamed how far it would come. Daytona is now considered the world center of racing, and Media Day has become larger than it's ever been before. So we here at The Hub decided it would take a two-hour show to cover the official start to Speed Weeks. So glad you could join us in just moments. We'll head to the track and chat with the biggest names in our sport. Speaking of, take a look at our lineup tonight. The champ, Brad Keselowski, Jimmy Johnson, Tony Stewart, Kyle Busch, Dale Earnhardt Jr., just to name a few, plus Danica Patrick. And speaking of Miss GoDaddy, she tops our news headlines tonight. Danica Patrick says she'll drive in the season opening nationwide race at Daytona for Turner Scott Motorsports. This will be her sixth nationwide start at the Super Speedway and plans to add more races to her schedule, but no further details have been released. NASCAR has announced a rule change for 2013, limiting a driver's communication to their team only. Drivers will no longer be permitted to radio other drivers, crew chiefs, or listen to their teammates' communication. And our 2012 Sprint Cup champ, Brad Kozlowski, is getting some face time Saturday night, even though he's not in the race. BK will join the crew at the Hollywood Hotel for the Sprint Unlimited on Fox. The first set of results are in for the Sprint Unlimited fan vote. We now know the format for the race. You guys decided it'll be broken down like this. 30 laps for the first segment, 25 laps in the second, and 20 laps for the third and final segment. But there are still more decisions for you, the fans, to make. You have until the green flag on Saturday night to decide on pit stops and until the start of the second segment to decide on eliminations. And let's not forget, fans at the track in Daytona will help decide the starting lineup. Speaking of the big track at the beach, let's travel from Charlotte, 472 miles down to the Super Speedway. That's where Steve Burns is standing by with more on the Unlimited. Thanks, Danielle. Happy Valentine's Day to you as well. And this year, fans here at the track will get the chance to vote on how the grid is set. There are three choices, career wins, 2012 points finish and the order that drivers won a poll in 2012. So what does that all mean? Well, here's a look at your potential front rows. Option one would put Jeff Gordon on the pole with teammate Jimmy Johnson. Starting second, option two would put Jimmy on the pole with another teammate, Casey Kane. Option three gets us away from an all-Hendrick lineup. This one would have cousin Carl starting on the pole with Mark Martin up front as well. Well, joining us now, Kyle Petty and Larry McReynolds. Now, Kyle, as a, as a driver, I like what Craig Biffle <laughs> said. We have a gas pedal, we have a brake pedal, and a steering wheel. Yeah. I don't care what the format is. Yeah, and, and you really don't. Once you're in this race, you don't care what the format is. I think it's not about the money for this race. I, I will say that. I don't think it pays a lot of money to win this thing. But I do think it's about getting on the track and understanding this Gen 6 car. Yeah, I, I like the format that the fans chose, though, because when I look at the other two options, I was not a big fan of either one. One was going to have them running 40 laps in the first segment. And quite honestly, the speeds they're going to be running here, it was going to be borderline making that on one tank of fuel. And the other option would have been a 10-lap shootout. I have never been a fan of a 10-lap no. shootout. I like this because we have 30 to start the race, we have 25 in the middle, and then we have that 20-lap segment three. I, I like the, the format that we've chosen here. I love shootouts under the lights on a Saturday night. It, but, Kyle... 22 drivers are eligible. Yes. We expect 19 to start. Uh, there are going to be some very interested 
drivers who aren't in it watching yeah. this race. And, and there always are. Larry, Larry will tell you, there, how many times have we seen the tops of these trucks absolutely full of drivers, crew chiefs, car chiefs, mechanics? It doesn't make any difference. They want to see not only what their teammates are doing, but what the other brands and makes of cars. And the other brands and makes, whether it's Toyota, Ford, Chevy, doesn't make any difference this year. It's going to be interesting to see how these, what these cars do. Well, and then I go back to last year when it was called the Budweiser shootout. Now the Sprint Unlimited. We had 25 drivers in that race. When it was over, we only had <laughs> half of them still out on the racetrack. We had 12 drivers in the garage area that were torn up. And that's what's going to be interesting about this other thing that the fans are going to vote on. How many drivers will be eliminated for that final segment? Will it be none? Will it be six, four, or two? Honestly, I don't. I, that's wishful thinking. We'll have that many drivers that's not already been knocked out because of a wreck in the first two Good segments. Point. Kyle Busch said, if, I, if I'm any kind of a salesman, I don't want the fans to eliminate any drivers. <laughs> I think, I think they they'll self-eliminate. Yeah. They will yeah. self-eliminate. It. It's a self-cleaning track. It is. <laughs> well, the Fox Sports family of networks just getting warmed up with our coverage of Speed Weeks. We really kick it off this weekend with the ARCA race on Speed, Saturday at 4.30 Eastern, followed by NASCAR race day at 6.30, which leads you right into the Sprint Unlimited on Fox at 8. Don't forget Daytona 500 qualifying Sunday. The front row is set 1 p.m. on Fox. We've got two full hours of Hub Goodness lined up for you tonight, and we're just getting started. We're going to hear from Jeff Gordon and Clint Boyer. Have they made up yet? We'll find out. We've got Tony, Danica, and Dale Jr., plus a whole lot more. But up next, we'll hear from the current champ and a former champ, Brad Keselowski and Jimmy Johnson kick off the day. That's next. NASCAR Race Hub is presented by Mobile One, the official motor oil of NASCAR, Mobile One. All right, this time last year, raise your hand if you predicted Brad Keselowski would be the Sprint Cup Series champion. Yeah, me neither. But that's exactly what he did, and he did it in style with his crew chief, Paul Wolf. He comes to Daytona as the defending champion. He's with John Roberts. Well, Steve, we are now joined by the 2012 Sprint Cup Series champion, Brad Keselowski. I know, Brad, that has a good ring to it, it for does. you. But how was the offseason being the ambassador of NASCAR's top series? I've had fun, but you know what? I'm ready to be done with the offseason. I'm ready to get to work. Uh, you know, for me... I got done and, you know, came here to the track last night uh, to get ready for today's uh, media day. And I got in my bus, and for the first time in about three months, I felt like I was home. So uh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, now you guys certainly do not rest on the laurels of a championship. Any competitor knows that once you get through this, you want to go after the next one. What steps have you guys been taking, knowing that there's a little bit of a target on your back as the champ? Well, in a competitive environment, if you stand still, you're going backwards compared to your competition. So we, we've been pushing forward, uh, whether we were a champion or not. And, uh, you know, hopefully it, uh, it will pay dividends this year. There's no guarantees it will, but we're going to work hard and do our best. And uh, I feel like I've got the, the same fire, the same desire out of myself and out of our team to, uh, to do it again. And there was a chemistry last year between you and Paul Wolf, your crew chief. Uh, what do you guys do to continue that, to continue working on that, to continue the communication as it is? Well, I think it's it's a relationship. It's it's like a marriage, you know. Paul's married, and I joke with his wife all the time that I'm his second wife, and <laughs> she says I might be his first. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, you just got to keep working, and the relationship is constantly developing. Uh, it can go bad just as well as it can go great. You know, if you miss out on your Valentine's Day gift, you know how you get in trouble with your wife. Well, yeah. you know, if you if I get a bad pit stop and I come out and yell to, at my team. Uh, then he gets mad at me. So, you know, you gotta, you got to manage that relationship, and it's very important. So how, how has this been living your dream, Brad? I mean, you grow up just, just uh, wishing to race in NASCAR's top series. Yeah, I'd have felt and, lucky just and, to have been able to compete. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it doesn't mean I didn't want to win. Yeah, but once now that you have that championship, uh, living this dream, how does it feel? You know, it feels like there's still more work to be done. You know, that's how it feels. I feel like I need to continue to win. I need to continue to push to be the best I can to really just justify where I'm at in the sport. And I want to make the sport stronger. I want to be a part of it uh, for years to come. That's my goal, but I want to be successful doing it. And uh, if, if that's going to happen, uh, I'm going to have to con continue to push myself to be the best I can and our team.
And we have also heard, you know, in the years past when we had the COT car, the Generation 5 car comes around, the team that gets a hold of it the best first is the one that's going to rock it ahead. What Absolutely. do you guys think of this new car, and where do you think you stand with it? I think we don't have a hold of it yet, but uh, I know if we keep working, we will. So what do you do with this car now? I mean, you haven't had much testing time. What, what's, the, what's the process? What do you go through as a driver? Well, I mean, I think uh, you got to get a few races under your belt. Uh, try to understand what issues you're fighting. You test and you do all these things, and you're like, oh, this is what we're fighting. Then you race, and you're like, oh, that's not what we're fighting. So um, I don't have a great answer for you on what we need to work on, but I know that we need to get racing for us to figure it out. And your teammate, Joey Logano, says he wants to try to help make this organization better. It's hard to make <laughs> it better with the championship, but how oh, it can be made better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, it can be made better. We want to get both cars in the chase, 22 and the two. Uh, and have both cars a, a threat for the championship. And I think if we can do that, I'll be better, and uh, certainly he'll be better, and all Penske Racing will be better. Well, Brad, congratulations once again on the championship, man. Keep up the good work. We Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you very much. All right, that is the champion, Brad Keselowski, and now Rutledge Wood is standing by with a five-time champion. Thanks, John. Caught up with Jimmy Johnson, Mr. Five-time. Man, how was your off-season? You have a lot of fun with the family? I did. Christmas was unreal. So much fun. Uh, New Year's was, was a great time, too. I had a nice vacation with some friends and my family. And uh, life is good, man. Ready to go racing. It's always cool to get to see you back here. Everybody's had their family time, got to be away, and, and sort of the fondness of racing is back. And I'm wondering, you know, you guys were so far ahead of Hendrick with the COT. How's everybody feeling about the Gen 6? Do you think you guys will be able to jump out ahead again? I feel good about it. Um, you know, with the, the COT, the rules stayed the same for a long period of time, and it allowed all the teams to kind of catch up, and I think that's the great parity that we saw at the end of the, the 2012 season. Um, new car, new opportunities, we hope, and, and we hope that, uh, you know, Hendrick Motorsports, and I really hope the 48 finds those things first, and we get the slow Chevy up front and win in a lot of races early. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a race within a race right now. Nobody knows. We've all tested. Um, I think NASCAR's done a great job of getting us up speed in the cars and get us some track time and even more track time as the season starts. Um, so car drives nice, looks awesome. And we're going to have a great start of the season, I believe. Now, I know the fans could, could all agree that your drive and love for the win has never changed you being in this sport, but winning five in a row and then missing two so closely, I somehow think that that drive has even gone up more. How do you feel about trying to grab that six pack this year? Man, it, it, it drive hasn't changed a bit. It still is, is pinned on, uh, you know, wanting as, as it's ever been. Um, even even during the, the, those championship years before, it's been a very steady, um, you know, feeling and sensation I've had and, and mindset that I've had. Um, I'm, I'm excited for this year. I think last year, you know, I look at the uh, 11 and 12. 11, we, we weren't in the mix. We, uh, halfway through the chase, you know, we're out and just didn't have a real good shot at it. Last year, we had control very late in the chase and it didn't come through but it just shows me how much of a team sport NASCAR really is and we seem to forget that at times and think more of just the driver in the car sure. on the track but you know we had a tire problem at Phoenix and then issues at Homestead and we, we don't win the championship and off we go so uh, you know great year though I don't want to point out those negatives we have a lot to be proud of from the way last year went and we're going to carry that into this year. And my last question, because I can't wrap my mind around it, you're going to run the half marathon and then drive in the 500, right? That, like, how did that decision process work in your mind? Well, we have the unlimited Saturday night, then the half marathons in the morning, and then we qualify that day. So uh, if we're just qualifying at the end, it's not a big deal. So A half a marathon, then you're going to hop in the car. It's only a half. It's not that far. You're crazy, man. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson, see, this guy can run. 13 miles is a long way, and Larry Mack, Kyle Petty back with us. And, you know, one thing about Jimmy Johnson, he looks incredibly fit, Larry. He gets up at 530 in the morning to train two years without that championship. It's obvious hearing from Rutledge Wood in that interview. He wants it back. Well, and, and he talked about that earlier in the week, uh, about his training and, and how it, it truly relates to being fit as, as a race car driver. He said, yeah, Daytona is mentally demanding, not really physically demanding, but he said most of the races that these guys run four, five, six hundred miles are very physically demanding. But he touched on this just a little bit when he talked to Rutledge, and I found it interesting what he said 
earlier in the week as well. He said he truly enjoyed this offseason. Even though they did not get to celebrate that sixth championship, he said the way they ended the year, so competitive. You know, after winning the races back-to-back -back at Texas and Martinsville, he was a points leader. He said after the 2011 season, he was miserable. He touched on it a little bit. He said, we were not competitive. We only won two races, and one of those races was a Talladega race. But he said, the way we ran last year, I truly enjoyed this offseason because I think he knows they're going to come back and be a contender this year. Kyle, let's switch over to Brad Keselowski. What does he have to guard against? I mean, I know they're switching to four different manufacturers. Yeah. I think they're going to be cool with that. But what does he have to guard against? How is his life going to change? And, and I, I don't know because I've never won a championship. Okay, <laughs> so I, let's be honest here. So I, I don't know that. But I look at Brad and I say, you know, he has entertained us all winter long since he's won the championship with his views and his opinions and his knowledge of everything of the sport from the sport of, of NASCAR to Ricky and Danica. I mean, he's got opinions on everything. But now the talking has to stop, and it has to be done on the racetrack. And this is a big year for these guys. I think you look at it. You know, last year, under the radar, as you said, I would have never picked him to win the championship. Under the radar, no pressure. Let's just go out there. Let's hammer it out. Let's win races. Let's do the best we can. That's going to be a big change. He's not a pretender anymore. He is the guy they're chasing. He is a contender. That's a big change for him this year. Going to Ford is a big change for those guys this year. So with the physical or the emotional side of it or the mental side of being that guy that everybody's shooting at and having new equipment to have to go do it with, I think there's a little bit of an unknown there going into their second season. All right, thanks, guys. As Danielle said, it was media day, and we've got media day covered from all angles. Social media is blowing up, and our very own Rutledge Wood is on deck to find out who's putting their tweeting thumbs to work. And we'll hear from Cousin Carl with 2012 in the rearview mirror and a new crew chief on board. Edwards laying out his 2013 blueprint next. How about this black flag, Carl Edwards? Black flag right here. NASCAR telling Bob Osborne, Carl, jump the restart. It's not cool to get a race taken, probably like that. This is not acceptable. We are better than this. I'm going to drive the hell out of this car, and we're going to be just fine. It's not hard to see why Carl wants to rebound this year. Taking a look at how his 2012 season stacked up against 2011. Wow, not pretty. Zero wins. His top fives dropped from 19 to just three. Top tens were cut in half as well. Another statistic that Carl will want to uh, make better, it was his worst finish in the points since starting full-time efforts in the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series, new crew chief, and a lot more going on with that 99 team. Let's go to John Roberts with Carl. Steve, thanks a lot. We are now joined by Carl Edwards, driver of the number 99 Roush Fenway car. And Carl, you are used to winning champion, running for championships and winning races. When that doesn't happen on a certain year, what do you do yourself as a driver to make sure you don't go back there? Oh, man, it's hard to, you've got to stay focused. You've got to stay realistic. You've got to question everything you're doing. And, um, but at the same time, you know, you don't want to, ch you don't want to change too much because the, the success that we had as a as a team, our, our number 99 fast small team had in 2011, we didn't really change that much in 2012, but the wheels just fell off and it went terribly. So what I've been trying to do is be the best I can be and prepare for success this year. So when you really look at what happened between the two years, there really wasn't that much difference. And it tells you how much the competition level has risen in Sprint Cup. Yeah, the competition level rises. You, you can never rest on what you've done. You know, a year ago, I sat right here at, at, at Media Day, and I said, hey, look, we're going to go out, we're going to win 10 races, we're going to dominate, we're going to win the championship. And I believe that. And we went out and sat on the pole at Daytona, and I thought, okay, just as planned. And then it all kind of went downhill steadily all year. And everyone, I mean hundreds of people have asked me, was well, that because you ran second? Is that the curse of the second place? And I keep saying no, 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 because I didn't feel like anything was different. But... But it just, it seems like when you have that big wind up and then let down that sometimes there is a, there's a negative effect. So hopefully the new car, the new Ford Fusion is awesome. Uh, we've tested really fast. Jimmy Finnick is a crew chief and all the resources that uh, Roush is putting into our 99 team. Hopefully those things pay off this year. It's got to be a welcome voice to hear in your ear uh, what yeah. you're testing or, or, or working with a guy like Jimmy Fennig with his track record. Yeah, it's, it, it's not just, hey, Carl, here's what I think we should do. It's, hey. Here's what uh, Bobby Allison did. Here's what Mark Martin did. Here's what Kurt Busch did. Here's what Matt Kenseth did. I mean, he can go down the list of guys that he has had success with, and it, uh, it's pretty humbling for me. So 
He's a true racer. All he wants to do is win races. He's last year's Daytona 500 champion crew chief. We are coming out here with guns blazing, and hopefully we get a, a huge season. And also, a lot of teams talk about getting a handle on this race car. And if you do, you're going to jet out in yes. front of the pack. What do you guys think about the car so far? And what do you think about your handle as a team on the car? Well, testing went very well at Charlotte. We were very fast there. All the Fords were. It was very good at Daytona. We went to Darlington the other day. And we weren't quite as fast, but we learned some things. And, and I think what you said is right. The team that can come out of the box and... and maybe knock off a couple of wins uh, that that opportunity is going to that window is going to close you know everybody's going to figure it out quickly and so jimmy all the guys at the shop everyone at the fab shop the engineers robbie riser everyone's been working hard to so that we're leading that pack well carl thanks a lot for your time we appreciate thanks, it appreciate best of luck it. this year all right steve back to you all right, thanks, Johnny. You know, over the past couple of years, social media has blown up. But for NASCAR, it has really blown up since last year's Daytona 500 when Juan Pablo blew up. Brad Kay tweeted from the track, and the rest is history. Today, Rutledge Wood caught up with a few of the sport's top tweeters. In Twitter, do you shave your chest this morning? It looks nice. What's on Twitter today? What are you following? What are you watching? Carl Edwards, do you know the question that I get asked maybe the most frequently on Twitter? When is Carl Edwards going to get on Twitter? I, I'll be honest. I'm just tired of answering. You know what's good with Nutella? Everything. Everything. Dan Kirkpatrick loves Nutella. And You're going to have to keep that dog back. that your girlfriend found. God, I hope not. Could you just join so that I don't have to answer that question? I've been thinking about joining Twitter. <gasps> what? First it was pictures of, oh, he's so cute. Now it's video. Yeah, it is fun. But then all you want to do is, uh, what do people say? What do, you know, what do they tweet back? And I don't need that in my life right now. I need to focus. Pancakes, eggs. Yes. That's what I'm going to do. Bananas. Uh, oh, gosh. Here we go. One, two. Hey, Carla, dude. Okay. Oh. Sounds like you've got a new dog. And a name to this dog. Oh, no. Yeah, Max. If you name it, it's yours. That's. I think that's the rule. So pour some Nutella on the top of it oh. like that. And I'll also hashtag it Romanesque architecture. That's good. Maybe like, uh, yeah. If anybody wants to tweet me... You can take Max. Piece of toast, cut it into a heart, mush some banana on it, and some Nutella and some peanut butter. It's neither Roman nor esque. Disgust. I eat a lot. <laughs> I'm behind here, the king of Twitter himself, Mr. Brad Keselowski, the champ. Don't step on my shoes when you show up in white shoes. Did you get those from my dad? Caught up with Denny Hamlin, proud papa. You have been tweeting some pictures out. How excited are you, Mr. New Dad? Hold it up like this, right? And can you do it where it points towards us? Yeah, really been the best three or four weeks that I've uh, I've ever had, that's for sure. For the last 10 years, every time I've been around babies, it, once they lock in eye contact, it's like they're mesmerized by me. I don't know what it is. Ladies, you know that uh, the cute girl behind us in the blue you were asking about? Yes. If you frame the shot just right, oh, yes. right there. Oh, my God. Hey, Heather. Brad. Oh, gosh. Man, is there any video of this? Are we live? As far as you know. That's a web exclusive that'll never air. I forgot the camera was even there. This is what it's like. It was like a crime scene the next day, trying to find my stuff. My pants were like half on the dresser, and I don't. I put my glasses in a vase, apparently. If you were to get into a conversation with Relage, it's what you just saw. That's fantastic. Apparently, my dad shouldn't pour drinks. We're not very good at this. Get that out of my face. <laughs> Speaking of social media, I'm looking at Twitter right now. It says, SI swimsuit. Come hang out with Kate Upton. Okay, I think I will. In Iceland, <laughs> where she shot. I don't care. <laughs> she shot. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> now, that's a good use of social media. <laughs> yes, it is. I think the funniest tweet I read today from a fan, and I do try to read all the fans' tweets, says, I don't care who or what Danica Patrick is dating. <laughs> I'm ready to hear engines on the racetrack. That's for another segment. Yes. <laughs> hey, but, uh, you know, talking about Carl, I think you have to be on, so on, on social media. You have to be on Twitter. We look around. All these sponsors have Facebook pages, and, and they have Twitter accounts. How can you be a professional athlete in today's society and not have a Twitter account and not be interactive with the fans? I, I don't care who you are. Yeah, you're interactive. You argue with them. Fans love me. <laughs> They love you. Love the fire. They up. love me. Send it, baby. Bring it. Bring it. Bring the heat. One thing Carl it. Edwards said that I that I'm going to challenge. To the contrary, he said nothing changed between 2011 to the 12. To the contrary, I think in 2011, Carl Edwards and Bob Osborne, even only the, the only one that won race, I think they were ahead of the curve 
with the skewing, with the cars dog tracking down the racetrack, and I think that worked to their advantage. Yeah, they were the same when 2012 started, but so many other teams had caught up. And talking about Jimmy Finney, Carl Edwards has met his match. Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. think they're going to be a great combination. Jimmy Finney, there's not a driver he's worked with that he hadn't had success. He's won 36 races plus the championship with Kurt Busch, but Jimmy Finney has told him, I don't care if you live in Missouri. I don't care if you do television. You will be engaged with this race team and with what we're doing. Yeah, and I, I, I think if you go and you look at Carl and you look at last year, that's the way Carl's career has kind of been. It started here. It goes up. It comes down. It goes up. He's only won three races since 2008 when he won his yeah. nine races. Three races. Brad Kay has won eight races since Carl Edwards. Now, I know that he finished second in points, and he was very competitive. But if you go back to those years before that, they were not consistent. They never found their stride. They hit their stride that one great year, and they tied for the points. I'm not going to say they got beat. They tied for the points. So when you look at it that way, that was a great year. And to come back with a year like that, but he had the same kind of year after he won nine races. He come back with nothing. Yeah, the number that blew me away from last year wasn't necessarily the lack of top fives or wins or top tens. He only led laps in five yes. races, and in three of those races, it was just one lap per race. But if you go by that cycle... It'll be a big year for Carl Edwards this year. Carl told me at testing, uh, Jimmy Fennick kind of scares me. Yeah, he's not going to play. He is not going to play. <laughs> All right, since it's media day in Daytona, let's make a top five list. We've collected some of our favorite moments between drivers and the media. And trust me, I don't think you'll want to miss these. Also, we'll hear from Tony Stewart after the break. Smoke seems to be a jack of all trades. But what happens when we add a track operator to his daily grind with team owner driver? We'll hear from the three-timer when we return to Daytona Beach. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Hub, presented tonight by Mobile One. When 2013 NASCAR Hall of Fame inductee Rusty Wallace was asked if there was anything in NASCAR he wanted to accomplish and never did, his answer? A Daytona 500 win. The crown jewel of our sport is something that has also eluded three-time champion Tony Stewart. Hard to believe Smoke has four wins in the Cup Series at Daytona, but all of them have come in the July race. Tony is in Daytona now with John Roberts. Danielle, thanks a lot. We're with three-time Sprint Cup Series champion Tony Stewart. And Tony, once you once you win a championship at NASCAR's top level, certainly you're used to winning them. Nothing else compares at a season end, does it? No, no. I mean, it's um, you know, unless you do something during the year that you haven't done, like in the Daytona 500, for example. So, uh, you know, that would be something different this year that that would change it. But um, you know, it, it is. It's hard. It's hard after you've won championships to to compare if you don't win a championship. Now, clearly you're not your stereotypical owner. Uh, you're not behind a desk every day pushing papers, but you still have a lot of input. Well, what was your goal in this off season for your team as an owner, not necessarily a driver? Uh, just getting everything caught up. You know, adding a third team this year was uh, a big undertaking. Um, and, and getting the parts that we all needed for all of our cars was a huge, huge hurdle across. So uh, luckily I've got Greg Zepidelli, so uh, he, he took that burden on all winter. And, um, you know, I actually got a little bit of time to get away and, and uh, recharge my batteries. When we talk to Danica Patrick, she often talks about how good of a teacher you are. And you often talk about how good of a student uh, she is. Uh, do you, of course, you feel she's ready uh, at this point. How successful do you think she's going to be in this first full-time season? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, we've got a we've got a totally new race car. We don't even know how we're going to do, let alone how she's going to do. So, um, you know, the the great thing is she has a good feel for a race car. She gives great feedback, and uh, you know, that's that's what Tony Gibson needs uh, to to make changes for. Her. So. Uh, you know, I, I wish everybody's got a lot of great questions on Media Day today about what's going to happen this year, but nobody really, truly can give accurate answers because we just, none of us have been in the cars very much. And you've driven just about everything on four wheels in a racing discipline. What do you think about this new car so far? I like it so far. I mean, the, the, we've, I've had a day and a half of test, tire testing at Phoenix, and then I had a day of testing at Charlotte other than here at Daytona. So, uh, you know, the, the Charlotte test, the car has a lot of downforce and is very, very stable. So, uh, 
you know, for NASCAR to come out with a new generation car and, and for it to drive that well right off the bat, it's a pretty big feather in their cap. I mean, they, you can tell they did their homework. Now, of course, Tony, you start out the season. You, you want all three cars in the chase. You, you want to win the championship for yourself, if not you, one of your drivers. Uh, do you guys set out goals at the beginning of the year like that, or do you need to even need to talk about them? We never talk about it because that's, that's, that's a given goal every year. I mean, anybody that... Uh, says something different than that it needs to work on their program because they're not where they need to be so uh, you know the biggest thing is you know Ryan and I obviously want to go out and, and win races try to get in the chase and have an opportunity to race for the championship uh, we would like Danica to be in that position too but I don't think it, it I don't think it's as realistic of a goal for her I think the biggest thing is just letting her get through this first full season uh, go to all the racetracks, run the 38 race schedule, and uh, you know just steadily see improvement each week. And you know there's going to be weeks that are going to be rougher than others, and tracks that she picks up on better than others. But uh, throughout the course of the year, on the average, we want to see just a steady improvement. For Danica especially, but for you and Ryan as well, how high has the competition level risen in the Sprint Cup Series across the board? Uh, every year it gets tougher and tougher, and, and this new generation car is going to make it even harder yet. I mean, especially with as good as it drives, it's going to be better for everybody. So, uh, you know, there's not going to be that separation in the field like you'd like to have as a driver, but uh, it's good for the fans and it's good for the sport too. So uh, it just makes us have to work that much harder. But it's, uh, you know, it's tough. I mean, it, it, and every year it's, it just seems like every year there's one or two guys you add to the list of guys that have potential potential to make the, ch the chase and, and have a chance at running for a championship. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good feather in NASCAR's cap, and it always has been. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Formula One can't say that every year. IndyCar can't say that every year. But NASCAR, that number has kept growing every year since I've been involved in the series. Uh, I've seen that firsthand. So, uh, and it was happening, you know, long before me, and it'll, that number will probably keep growing long after I'm gone. Well, Tony, thanks for your time. We appreciate right. it. Best of luck this year. Thank you. Danielle, Tony Stewart is a three-time champion, but wants to start out this year with that elusive Daytona 500 win. Thanks, JR. Tony is not only a driver, but a team owner, and he's added a third full-time cup team with Danica Patrick for her first full cup season. Ryan Newman is on a one-year deal with SHR as he enters his 12th full season in the cup series. Today, of course, is Media Day in Daytona, where drivers spend nearly 12 hours giving television, radio, print, and internet-based interviews. These are reporters coming from across the globe asking everything from the serious question to the utter ridiculous. So we thought it'd be a great time to share our top five favorite driver media interactions. At number five, the year was 2010. In his second full-time cup season, Joey Logano got tangled up at Pocono with Kevin Harvick, and the young talent gave the media his thoughts after the race. Race in 29, and um, he let me go in the middle of the straightaway and uh, decided to dump me in the next turn. I don't know what his deal is with me, but uh, it's probably not his fault. You know, his, his wife wears a fire suit in the family, tells him what to do, so it's probably not his fault. Number four was last season when Clint Boyer was in the thick of a championship run but couldn't stay focused. And we're going to focus. we got to pick the pace up here. Well, how many races? Five races left? I was pretty impressed with the tightrope. That's Chad Canals. I don't even remember what the hell you said. I went back hunting yesterday and saw a huge deer. Focus is a little bit of an issue for me anyway, Bob. I, I really woke up this morning thinking about that deer for some reason. I know I, I need to, uh, to try to win this championship. But that deer yesterday was huge. It was huge, Bob. I missed that deer that I was talking about in Texas, though, if that makes you feel any better. My neighbor shot it. It sucked. And who could forget our number three? Why can't we take this? And I wanted, to, I wanted to finish, to go there and put together the results that we can. We need to, um, this is fun. This is entertainment, right guys? This is why you guys are all here suffocating me. It refrains me from not beating out of you right now because you ask me stupid questions. Number two came early last season when fans were asking for more caution. So after multiple wrecks at Dega, Tony played tongue in cheek with the media. We don't crash half of the field by the end of the race. They need to. They really need to extend it because, I mean, that's what that's what the fans want. They want to see that excitement. I'm upset that we didn't crash more cars. I mean, I feel like the feel like that's what that's what we need. You know, that's what we're here for. I feel bad if I don't spend at least $150,000 in tour up race cars going back to the shop. It would have been a lot more fun if I could have got caught up in one more wreck. If I could have done that, it would have been perfect. 
Number one takes place in our own victory lane set after Brad had too many Miller lights after winning the ch title. Brad Keselowski Love just it. got us with the beer. Way to go, man. <laughs> Congratulations, Brad. Congratulations. Awesome, buddy. Come sit on my lap here, brother. We can't, All right. we can't here plan this. Are you tired? Is my Twitter better than yours? Well, he's, got, he's got my beard. Hey, give me my beard back, Roger. <laughs> I think they may have found their man. God bless him. <laughs> if I could share this beer with all of you, I would, but this one's mine. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, Larry is in trouble. That's great. Speed Weeks have arrived. Coming up, we'll talk to JGR's newest addition, Matt Kenseth. Find out how he's settling in. But first, his new teammate, Rowdy, is coming on the show next. He missed the chase last year. We'll hear about his goals for 2013. And who's going to be the leader of this JGR Brat Pack? After 13 full seasons, 24 wins and a championship, Matt Kent has shocked us all by saying he was leaving Roush Fenway Racing at season's end to move to Joe Gibbs Racing. Let's hear from Matt and Rutledge Wood. Thanks, Steve. Caught up with Matt Kent. Matt, how was a little off-season time with the family? Great. What'd you guys do? Hung out. Yeah? Anything mm -hmm. fun? Yep. Snowmen? Yeah. Did you get a little snow? Yes. We're gonna we're gonna spend another year like this, aren't we, funny guy? How you doing, man? How you been? Doing good. <laughs> the off season has been good. Um, got a blizzard right before we showed up in Wisconsin for Christmas. So that was fun. We got to do the snowman thing. Got to go snowmobiling with my buddies. Uh, and the kids got to go sledding. Went sledding with them. So had a lot of fun up there in uh, God's country for a week. And then uh, ever since then, I've really just been home and um, getting ready to race. Spend spend some time at the shop and. Um, getting ready to get in a racetrack. Well, tell us about, uh, obviously, the big change to going to Joe Gibbs. So what's it been like for the offseason for you to kind of get to know everybody, put time in at the shop? What's that sort of transition been like for you? It's been really fun. I mean, now it's time to, to, to go out and do your job and perform and you know, put up the numbers and do all that. But it's, it's been really fun. I really enjoyed getting to know Jason, um, everybody, uh, everybody over there, and try to learn more about the organization and you know how they how they do things and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's all been really fun. But like I said, I'm really excited to get to the track, start racing, get out there in competition, and uh, you know this is a fun week for that. We get to do the Sprint Unlimited and then uh, you know get to get to hopefully learn some things there and apply that for Thursday for the the qualifying races and then apply them again for the 500. So it's a fun week for that. Looking forward to getting in a groove with these guys. Now, for you, is the approach any different? Uh, obviously, being with Roush for so long, then now coming over to Joe Gibbs, it, are there is a different set of checklists for you of things you want to learn and, and people you want to get to know kind of going through the whole process? Or I, I know it's just another race week for you, but there's obviously there's a whole new sort of group of people and things that they do to learn, right? Yeah, I mean, the goal is the same every week, and I don't know if the approach is necessarily a lot different, but there's certainly uh, um, there's certainly things they do different. You know, they, they approach things different, look at things different. Um, you, you know, so there's a lot of... A lot of things there to learn, you know, how people operate and kind of, you know, kind of learn each other's language, that, that type of thing. But um, they got used to my Wisconsin accent and how I talk really fast. So I think Jason's going to need a translator for a few weeks. But, um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, your goal is the same. Everybody goes to racetrack trying to win. Let's check in with John, who's got one of his teammates. Johnny? Well, Rutledge, of course, every offseason has a lot of change, but one team that is basically intact is that of Kyle Busch. Now, Kyle, every season has its ups and its downs. What do you look back at last season? What do you want to take forward, and what do you want to forget? Uh, you know, you want to take forward the success that we had in the final 10 weeks. You know, we ran really well. We ran strong. We um, had the second-best chase average, I think it was, uh, even with um, an engine problem that we had at Loudoun. So um, that was really good for us, but... The whole rest of the year is probably something that you want to forget. I mean, we did have one win at Richmond and then followed it up, I think, with five consecutive top fives. And then after that, it was just um, chaos. You know, they say ups and downs, but it seemed like our whole year was down. We couldn't dig ourselves out of the hole. It's got to be quite a balancing act for you as a driver to know you guys have the ability to be up there. But one thing we can't control is some of the mechanical stuff that goes on. It just seems like you guys had a little bit more than your share of the mechanical problems. We did. We had uh, three engine failures in a row, and then we had a brake rotor explode at Pocono, and then we had a shock brake on us at uh, Kentucky, you know. So just things that um, shouldn't happen happened to us, and it, seemed, it wasn't happening to our team cars, you know. So for whatever reason, it was stuck on the 18, and that was unfortunate for us that... You know, we, we had such a, a strong 
we, well, I mean, we almost still made the chase. We were three points from making the chase, even with all that happening. And uh, then we had a strong finish to the season. So it kind of makes you looking forward to 2013. And you also got a good new teammate coming over, championship contender all the time and past yep. champion in Matt Kansas. Yeah, Matt's, uh, he's a great teammate. I mean, I've, I've raced him like teammates on the racetrack since I've been in the Cup Series. And we've never had a spat. We've always been well, uh, well respected each other and everything there. So I don't think much will change in that, in that area. But being able to work with Matt and being able to talk to him and discuss things and see how his mindset is about, you know, our team, our organization, the parts, the pieces, everything that goes into it, that uh, I think he's got a good insight on that. He's got a lot of years of experience and what he's had over at uh, Roush that's been able to win him championships, you know, he's, he still has some of that in memory. So hopefully he can help us out. So you guys have a different look to the beginning of the season this time around with the Sprint, Sprint Unlimited. Mm -hmm. Some of your fortune is in the hands of the fans so far. What do you think about the change to the opening race? I think it's interesting. You know, it's definitely a, a neat experience for the race fan, for sure. I mean, they get to decide on the format and, of course, how we pit, when we pit, all that kinds of stuff, what happens. And then, uh, you know, lo and behold, at the end of the race, they get to decide on what uniform Miss Sprint Cup gets to wear in victory lane. <laughs> so, uh, you know, who, who would have imagined that uh, you'd have that much voting po uh, power when it comes down to a cell phone. But Sprint does a great job with that. We love those guys. They do such a great job for our sport and uh, the promoting and everything that they do. You know, it's going to be a great season opener. Well, Kyle, I want to wish you the best of luck Thank this you. season. Keep up the good work, and we'll yeah. look for you on the racetrack and in victory lane. All right, making the chase, baby. And, and, exactly, and see if you can guarantee somewhere along the line you're going to see this guy in a victory lane. No question, JR. By the way, it, you're voting on what fire suit they wear in victory lane. I just want to clear that up. Fire suit. Yes, I want to clear that up. Right. Matt Clark with us now. Interesting story, dynamics at Joe Gibbs Racing. Right. Matt Kenseth coming in. Let's start with the first part of it, which is a lot of people think that Matt Kenseth has the maturity, the leadership ability that is really going to elevate the game of Denny Hamlin and Kyle Busch. You know what he's got else, too, Steve? What? A championship. Good point. So Joe Gibbs added another championship this year, added Darian Grubb last year. That's two championships that they haven't earned yet, but Joe Gibbs is surrounding his people with people who know how to win. Matt Kenseth will help, and you heard Kyle in that piece, will help them. He will be a go-to guy that these younger guys can look at and say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Can I do this better? And you heard Kyle talk, right? Three motor failures, a brake rotor broke. Yep. I mean, honestly, they had a bad year, but a lot of it mechanical. You look at what they did in the chase, it was incredible. Now let's look at the other part of it. I, I think Matt Kenseth is in the prime of his career yes. with great equipment. Jason Ratcliffe is his crew chief. I think he can be a championship contender right out of the box for JGR. What about you, Matt? I honestly believe that. And this is not a knock against Joey Logano. This is just simply you're adding Matt Kenseth, a brand name, a guy who knows how to win. He won the Daytona 500 last year. He's a guy who's won the last two out of four plate races. I think he just elevates the organization by bringing that winning attitude. And what I like about Matt? He's a flatliner. He doesn't really get rattled. And those two guys, Denny Hamlin and Kyle Busch, will play off of a guy who is a senior leader in the garage and on the track. And by the way, Keselowski is going to help Joey Logano over there. Rising tide lifts all ships. I'm telling you right now, that, that pairing right there over there, Penske Racing, also will pay dividends, Steve. I agree. All right, more from Daytona Speed Week straight ahead. Clint Boyer and Jeff Gordon. Okay, we know they probably don't want to talk about a certain brawl and what's happened since then, but we're going for it. It is Valentine's Day after all. Speaking of Valentine's Day, we'll hear more from one half of the first couple of NASCAR. Danica is set to chat it up with Rudd. Danica Patrick. Danica Patrick. Danica Patrick. Danica Patrick behind the wheel. It's the intangibles that make her great. It's her attitude. It's her desire. It's her passion. It's her ability to laugh at herself. She can drive a race car. She's got the skills, but she has all those intangibles, and that's what makes her great. The warm-up phase for Danica Patrick is over. This year, she's going full-time in the Cup Series with owner Tony Stewart. She spoke with Rutledge Wood. Here they are. Thanks, Steve. I am with Rookie of the Year contender Danica Patrick. So, Danica, how was your offseason? What did you get to do? Anything fun? Um, let's see. Uh, the holidays. I spent the holidays with my folks. That was really good. Um, I, you know, enjoyed some snow. I made a snowman. Oh, good. I've made a snowman since I was like six. It's a good time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. When is the last time you made a snowman? I'm I'm a gigantic you, kid, so I you, made one a few weeks you, ago. You have kids? Yes, two kids. Yeah, so I, I feel like 
Well, anyway, it was really like light, fluffy, powdery snow, and it was like hard to pack it. That's a so tough it snowman a to make. Production. It was a production. But the funny thing is, is, at the end of it all, once the snow had finally melted, since the snowman had a hat on, it had a cap. It, it had a whole deal, and uh, Brussels sprout eyes. Um, all of the all of the food and the hat was laying on the grass, <laughs> like it had just melted down. I thought my mom took a picture of it and she sent it, and she said that there's only the snowman's hat left. And I thought how funny she took it back outside and set it down on the ground. No, she's like it just melted down, that's and that's it. what was left. But nobody, no animal came and took the food. I mean, that just shows kind of the level of love for Brussels sprouts in the world. I was going to say, I've started to enjoy even, Brussels sprouts, but even the animals, no. Even a random animal walking around outside does not want to take the Brussels sprouts. It says something. I get why my kids don't like it them as much. says they need bacon and oil and salt. Foodie here. So, all right, foodie. So now, this year, Speed Week's totally different than ever before. This is full-time cup schedule driver Danica Patrick. How's it feel? I agree. I thought it was, I thought you were going to say something about the setup. I'm like, there's so many different rooms this year. This is like, look at this. Do, do they always have these big boards that say Media Day on them? No, th this is just for you. This is a big deal. It kind of seems real deal. It like kicked it up a notch. Is it like it? Does it feel different? Or I know this is just you race cars. It's what you do. Me on their computer, and I'm really hoping you Photoshop me a little bit less shiny. You're like, oh my gosh, I love media day. Is that what take that picture heat, says? Take the red down. Take the heat down. <laughs> so it's just another day for you, yeah, isn't hang it? Hang on, watch this. Watch this. Look at that. Look at that. He can take the red down, make it a little bit more soft. And then you can give me um, blue eyes. And there, yeah, yeah. See, look at how that works. You can give me blue eyes and you can. Um, He's why I have a beard. The first picture he took of me put a beard on. I was like, that looks pretty good. I'll keep that. It does look good. Like I said, you look, you look great. You're sweet. Thank you. Hey, they announced this morning. Uh, tell us a little bit about your nationwide plans. Yeah, um, with Turner Scott Motorsports, I'm going to do, uh, going to do the nationwide race in the 34 car, which is, um, which is cool actually. They didn't even know it, but this is my mom's number when we were racing go karts when we cool? first started. It was her number was 34 because she was 34 when we started, and I was 10 when I started, which is why I was number 10. And my number was my sister's number was 65, but she was not 65 when she started. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it, that's cool. GoDaddy's the sponsor. So between GoDaddy and, um, and uh, Mr. Turner and Scott, they brought it all together. And good, going to get more seat time. It's going to be awesome. You know, I'm going to do more, too. I'm going to try and do more. If we can get the sponsorship together, we're going we're gonna to do more. That's going to be great. You know you were one of our favorite guests last year on Trackside. Obviously, a lot of love for you there. Kyle made you a song. I want to know uh -huh. what fun stuff are we going to get to that do together this year. That was awesome. That that was a really funny little storyline. And good. maybe I only maybe maybe those happen all the time, but I just noticed it because it was about me. But I was very flattered, and especially from him because he's had his opinions about me. And he loves you now. Do, does he? He does. He does. I don't know anyone who doesn't. You know who loves you? Um, Steve my Burns. My dad. And your dad, Steve. She loves you too, <laughs> Danica Patrick. Oh, uh, thank you. It is Valentine's Day after all. <laughs> all right now, I heard snowmen. Brussels sprouts. I, no conversation I about her. No. I want her, to sing Frosty the Snowman. No conversation yeah. about her relationship with fellow driver Ricky Stenhouse. Yeah, I get. Look, I, I got nothing to say about that either. Yeah, I got. You want to talk racing? Let's talk racing. Yeah, I got nothing out of that interview. To be totally honest with you, I hate to say <laughs> I that mean, she, hey, she about, about her and Rutledge, but I got nothing. Uh, they're talking about. Snow. You know what that little white stuff is? Oh, never mind. Yeah, don't. I, I, I mean, no, no, we were no, talking no, about. No, no. Uh, never mind. We were talking about snowman. But here, my point is this: is here we are at Daytona for the Daytona 500, our Super Bowl, our biggest race. Everybody has talked all all winter long. That's brand new car, brand new stuff. Gen 6. Let's get excited. Dale Jr. is as excited as I've ever seen him at Daytona. And the big story is Ricky and Danica, two rookies who will not be a factor in any race this year, no matter where we run, and you heard it here first on the hub, won't be a factor in any race, won't be a factor for the championship, and they're the big story. This is not TMZ. This is the hub. This is NASCAR racing, and we should be talking about it. And you're the heat miser. I'm sorry. You melted the snow. Yeah, pan. but I'm sorry. Uh, here's what blows me away. And it's their I, personal I, business, listen, anyhow. It is their, and, and it's their personal business. business. Right. I firmly I, believe I, that. I know she brings new eyeballs to the sport. Yes. I, yes. I'm cool with that. I agree with but that. But why was Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, I read the transcript. Every Everybody. driver was asked about their love life today. Yeah. 
I can't tell you why they were asked about it and why we're talking about it now a Friday afternoon, Friday evening. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I've always said, okay, it's news, but it's not a story. It's not going to be a story until something happens on the track or they break up. It's news. I'm tired of talking about them as a couple. Let them enjoy their coupleship, their friendship, whatever yeah, they got going. Exactly, whatever they and got let's going. Let's go racing, man. It's Gen 6, Daytona 500. We got the ultimate coming down the pike here. Yeah. I mean, let's talk racing. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if something happens to them on a racetrack, it's a springer episode. Episode, and we're going to see it right oh, here in Lord. front of us. It'll develop right here in front, but that's for down the road. This is Daytona. This is the day that all the media comes and they hype everything, and everybody's excited. Everybody's on equal footing right now, except for those two. They're not going to be a factor this year, but everybody else is on equal footing, and I think when you look at it, it should be about Daytona. Well, as radio legend Barney Hall would say, we are at cross flags with this show. <laughs> Halfway. Halfway. Mayhem in the late laps here at Phoenix. Remember Phoenix, up next we talk to Jeff and Clint to see if Valentine's love can replace a Phoenix grudge. NASCAR Race Hub on this Valentine's Day. Our Hub Love gift to you is a second hour of the show featuring some of your favorite drivers from Media Day in Daytona. Of the 12 drivers joining us tonight, five remain, including four time champ Jeff Gordon, last year's runner up Clint Boyer, and NASCAR's most popular driver, Dale Earnhardt Jr. In case you missed it earlier in the show, the first set of results are in from the Sprint Unlimited fan vote. We now know the format of the race. Fans decided Saturday night it'll be broken down like this. 30 laps for the first segment, 25 in the second, and 20 laps for the third and final segment. There's still time to vote on pit stops and driver eliminations, so get to NASCAR.com and vote. Last year, the final race of the regular season at Richmond became a nail-biter between Jeff Gordon and Kyle Busch. As they battled it out for the 12th and final spot in the chase, it came down to a one-point decision, with the four-time champ getting the edge. Although Gordon couldn't translate that into a championship, he says the 24 team grew stronger through last year's struggles. For more, JR is standing by with Jeff. Danielle, we are now joined by four-time champion, three-time Daytona 500 winner, Jeff Gordon. And Jeff, you have had a chance to drive a lot of different cars in your time and a lot of different generations of NASCAR Sprint Cup cars. What are your initial impressions of this Gen 6 car? Oh, they're very positive. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll be the first one to point things out when I don't like them, like I did with the, the COT. I just wasn't a fan of the way it looked. I wasn't a fan of the way it drove. Uh, we, we progressed with that car, not necessarily in the looks department, but certainly uh, in, in how it drove. The last couple of years, the cars actually drove really well. Uh, this car looks good, drives good. Um, I think it's going to, you know, perform and race really well. So I'm excited. You know, I, I feel like it's important when a new car is brought out uh, that it, you're always taking a step forward with technology and design and, and, and performance. Oh, we got something exciting to look forward to, and it's only the beginning stages of it. I think through the development stages through each race in the first 10, 15 races of the season, it's just going to keep getting better. One of the most exciting parts of last season was you and your team racing your way into the chase at the last minute. One of the most puzzling parts of last season was the way the year started out for you guys. With all those ups and downs, what do you take away from last season? Well, you know, you always try to to look at the things that you can control uh, and, and the things that you could have done better and, and, and try to you know, make sure that, that you do your job, do it well, and, and find your weaknesses. And I feel like, you know, early in the season, we had some silly things happen to us. And even though you could say, oh, well, that was out of our control, we ran over something, cut a tire, or, uh, you know, like here we had a radiator hose with a hole in it, did something poke it, what, what happened? I mean, it's all those things where I still feel like you got to do everything you can to make sure those situations don't don't happen so you cross that off your list and then it's just about execution and putting right fast race cars out there so what I love is the fact that our team learned a lot we stuck together fought through some tough times had a long way to climb up and then had that amazing you know drive to get to Richmond in in that Richmond race and it just brought us close together as a team uh, also with with um, Alan and myself I love him as a crew chief and and then to win the final race really just kept that energy over the offseason 
Yeah, that's uh, you were one of the guys that didn't want the season to end. Clearly, after that, uh, after that happened. But no, I was ready for it. Oh, you end. were ready. For it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know why? Because I got to enjoy a win for months yes. instead of for just a week. Yeah, one of the best to win. But <laughs> how important, Jeff, is it to get off to a good start? I mean, you've won this. Uh, you you won the unlimited race before to start the season. Uh, you won the Daytona 500. How important is a good start? Well, the unlimited is is just great knowledge. You know, you just want. Yeah, of course, you want to win it, but you want to be in that race learning something that's going to help you win the Daytona 500, biggest race that we have all year long. Of course, it's awesome to start the season out with a Daytona 500 win. Nothing's better than that. But that doesn't guarantee what's going to happen for the championship. And the championship is really what it's all about. So, um, you know, we got off to a rough start last year, and, and, and we found our way, but we could have found it much earlier. And I think that's going to be the key. It's not about coming out of Daytona with a top five, but it's I think coming out of here with a, a 35th or 40th is definitely – getting yourself in a hole that now with the competition gets so much tougher to find your way out of. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for yeah, your time. And you best Tom. of luck this season. Appreciate it. You that do. is Jeff Gordon, a four-time champion. Right now, let's go over to uh, Rutledge, who is standing by with last year's runner-up in points. Think we could Thanks, here? John. I am with Clint Boyer. Clint, you had quite the off-season there, buddy, didn't you? Conditioner in that beard. I do. Is what do you like use on your face? Conditioner. Not conditioner. There is a beard conditioner. There's like a whole wax you know, kit. We, it was fun. We were, uh, you know, when I, I dress, I try to match my shoes, you know, with my outfit. You see how that works? Yeah, that's nice. Hunter Green, matching shirt, looked good. I Thank was, you. I was into it. Thank you. And then what the hell happened there? With what? With blue and red shoes. Well, th these, these are my globes. I just, I think you can wear sneakers with anything. Oh, but what, blue? With green? I've got the color palette of like an eighth grader here, okay? I'm just, I'm working with the best I can. Would you, did you blindfold yourself and get ready this morning? So, there you are. All right, what's the deal with these weird, awkward pictures you keep tweeting about like a caravan with a, did it have a big top tent in the center of it? Oh, yeah, yeah there's a car I, I drove on top of here. You, you saw it, thanks. That made me uncomfortable. Did you see the picture that my wife tweeted this morning of what she made for our daughters, all the heart-shaped stuff? Why we're bashing on you right now. I get a tweet. All right, so I was, what was I doing? I was in Atlanta. Yeah, this week. Doing a deal with uh, CNN, talking uh -huh. about Gen 6 cars, love and life. I have to do a radio call in, and I get this text from Rutledge. Hey, man, those are my boys. They're so cool. The regular guys, really Rock 105. Regular good guys. They're looking forward to talk to you. You're going to love them. That's the text I get. It's not five minutes later. I call in, get a hold of the lady, which I waited for about three minutes for, on hold. Good guys. Waited on hold with the good guys for three minutes to have the lady go, yeah, our last interview ran late. We don't have time for you. So, I'm so sorry, good guys. <laughs> no, no, they're they were they That's are indeed boy, regular guys. Rutledge. Did you have fun in Atlanta, my hometown? No. Why not? I got blown off by the the good guys. All right, well, let's I fun mean, in my like book. Fun in my book might be I don't know like I uh, did like Robin Mead. Yeah. So who doesn't She's like? Way she, I love better her. Better interviewer than you are. Well, yeah, for many reasons. Yeah. You want to talk racing? No, I want to know right. New Year's Eve. How did you end up on P Diddy's yacht? <laughs> I wish I could tell you. Is that one of those nights that the next day you try to put the clues together you ever to how seen the movie you know? Hangover? Yeah, oh yeah. You know when that camera just mysteriously That's shows what it was like. up the next day, you're like, "Hey, that was a good time." Oops, on P Diddy's boat. Was it like you, you and Harvick? That is P Diddy. Did you guys have the buddy system to make sure like no Harvick one's going to end up in the know, Caribbean? We've always had a good time together, and we had a blast down there. It really was uh, a neat, you know, atmosphere. And, um, Jimmy John. Anytime you go on a vacation with Jimmy John or anytime that Jimmy John calls and asks you to go on a vacation, say yes. It was the best do vacation you, I've ever had. Do you remember? There was no good guy radio station down no, there. There was either. not, but yeah. I heard that Jeff Gordon was on the same boat. Is that boat. like an AM station? Do, are they even? That's no, a real one. Was it a real life radio station? I promise it is. Was it? So Jeff sure was on the same yacht? This. Jeff's on the same yacht for, for New Year's, and I assume the boat's big enough that it took a little while for you to realize, hey, there's that guy. Yeah. No high fives? Was uh, it a casual high five? Or are you guys getting closer? Like, oh. I, once again, it's so, still a little. At what point when I told you I didn't, I, I don't, didn't know that I was on okay, that boat? Okay, but if we had a camera, do you think there was a handshake, a high five? Man overboard? <laughs> <laughs> I did throw him the donut. Now, see, that's really nice. That's, yes. You're a good man. Yeah. Hey, good luck this didn't year. Have a rope hooked to it, but it was, nonetheless, I didn't want him to drown. It's a good man. Clint Boyer doesn't want anybody to drown.
Hey, are we ready to go on yet? Yeah, tell Steve hi. Burnsy? Yeah. Hi, Burns. This was awkward. <laughs> we blew it. We didn't do very good. <laughs> <laughs> that was awkward. That There's was. a lot going Did, on there. You used this phrase earlier. If you learned anything from that interview right there, <laughs> raise your hand. That's true. That's true. Uh, I got to give you. You know, Kyle, a lot of people, I mean, look, Clint Boyer said he's, he doesn't want to talk about the rivalry with Jeff yeah. Gordon. I'm sorry. He's going to get dragged back into it because it was so uh, spectacular what happened at the end of the season there at Phoenix. But... Um, yeah, I know drivers never forget, but he's going to have to pick his spot if, in fact, he carries his forward. Yeah, and, and I look at things different, and I'm, I'm sorry. I, they had a wreck, and they got mad at each other. That does not make a rivalry. A rivalry was the King and Pearson. A rivalry was Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace, who run, run with him for so long. And all those guys. So, in essence, had they had a fight. They had a fight. They had a fight and a wreck. That's what they had. A rivalry takes place over time. Clint and, and, and Jeff, the way Jeff's season went, he had such bad luck, and Clint had such good luck. They were on opposite ends of the spectrum most of the year. They never raced with each other. The time they did race with each other, they wrecked. That's a wreck. That's not a rivalry. But I do believe that seed's planted there, that if it comes down and they go through this year and you see them running fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth, first and second, then it becomes a rivalry, and they haven't forgotten. Clint Boyer, never. he's not going to forget. No, but I, I do truly believe if Jeff Gordon wants to keep this going, and Clint Boyer can oh, yeah. be a player. Oh, he, oh, yeah. he, he He's went there. to the right place. But, but I go back to what happened last year. I, I think this all goes back seven months, roughly, before Phoenix. Let's face it, Jeff Gordon, he talked about it. Started the year off dismal. Right here at Daytona, upside down in the Sprint Unlimited race. Blows an engine in the Daytona 500. A few weeks later at Bristol, his teammate cuts his tire down. Looks like he's got a car that can win the race. He was a frustrated individual. But in Jeff Gordon's mind, if you look at that Martins race. Clint Boyer possibly took the opportunity for Jeff Gordon to give Rick Hendrick that 200th win. We can all talk about they just wanted Rick to get that 200th win. Jeff Gordon wanted to be True. the guy to give him that win, and he feels like Clint Boyer took that away. Yeah, I Kyle, agree with that. Kyle, Clint Boyer finishes second in points. Yes. In his first year with MWR, did he overachieve? And can he win the championship this year? Oh, my God. Did Michael Waltrip Racing overachieve last year? Yeah, I think they did. I don't think anybody saw that coming uh, in, in 2012. I think that was the story was Michael Waltrip Racing. And then on top of that, you put Clint Boyer. So he definitely overachieved. Can they maintain that now? Yes, I believe they can maintain what they built last year. Yeah, what I like about Clint Boyer and Brian Patty in that 15 team, they, they won and they performed at all types of racetrack. They wanted yes. a road course. They wanted a short track. They won it. Charlotte, but it wasn't just like they had an isolated type of a racetrack they were good at. They were good across the board, and they had speed every single week. His crew chief, Brian Patty, says they are well prepared for this season as well. Let's go back to Charlotte and Danielle Trotta. Thanks, Steve. Coming up, it's the moment many fans have been waiting for. And ladies, this may be as close as you're going to get to your NASCAR Valentine. Dale Jr. is next on The Hub. is a new sheriff in town, and his name, Dale Earnhardt Jr. There is going to be a party in Junior Nation tonight. The streak is over. Dale Earnhardt Jr. back to Victory Lane in Michigan. So you guys have been waiting on that one. I know I am. That was a great moment for our sport last season and became a major headline in mainstream news around the country. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s winless streak had ended, and ironically, it came at the same track as his previous win in 2008. But after making the chase in 2012, Dale suffered a concussion, forcing him to miss two races in the postseason. But Dale is back and ready to race for a championship in 2013. Let's head down to Daytona, where John Roberts is standing by with NASCAR's most popular driver. Well, Danielle, it was clearly the most asked question in NASCAR last year. When is Dale Jr. going to win a race? And Dale Jr., you did that. How big was it for you to get that off your back? Well, it was, uh, you know, we had been running well throughout the whole season, and we were sort of anticipating that win coming. And uh, once it finally did, you know, we were hungry for more, you know, and we were sort of disappointed that that didn't happen again. We, we still remained competitive throughout the rest of the season, uh, but just couldn't start to pile wins on. 
like we want to, and we hope that in 13 we can make that happen. Well, you won last year, you led the points, but still more people were talking about you stepping out of the race car with the concussion, and all the people said it was a very good idea to do that. It's very difficult for a driver to give up his seat. Yeah, it was real hard to do. We were, um, we were sort of... Uh, you know, had some great momentum as a team. I didn't want to disrupt that. I, I didn't want to let, I felt like I was letting my guys down, not being there, not being able to compete. And uh, we had, you know, we had things going in the right direction. We've been, the guys had worked so hard to really give us this opportunity throughout the season to be competitive and be consistent that uh, just one week out of the car, I felt like we could derail that and that could all go away. But uh, Regan stepped in, he kept things going. They were able to be fast, be able to learn stuff. So when I got back in the car, everything seemed just as it was before. And I think that that helps us throughout the off season to, to maintain our confidence that we can continue to improve and have a good t 2013. Now, as a crew chief, Steve Letarte had some trouble early on in his career. Once he got together with you, it seemed like things have escalated. Are they still going up with your communication? How good can you guys really be together? I think that we can accomplish a lot of great things. I think we can win multiple races in a season, and we can actually be a legitimate contender in the chase. We, we, we've been a talked about contender leading up to the chase throughout the regular season last year. This year, we want to make that a reality and, and, and put ourselves in, uh, you know, in homestead with a chance to win the championship. Now, you're one of the drivers that's in the Sprint Unlimited this year, and it's going to change things the way we start out the season. But you've won this race before, and you've also had some great starts, including a Daytona 500 win. How important is it with a race like the Sprint Unlimited and, and with this speed, these speed weeks to get off to a good start? Well, when, whenever you can come out at the very beginning of the season and you can win that first race, uh, it really boosts the confidence of the team. And it, ta it makes everybody else take notice, uh, not only for the rest of the year, but for the Daytona 500, there, here's a guy that I'm going to have to compete against. And here's a guy that actually is going to probably find himself with more draft and help and find himself in position to have an advantage in the draft uh, because we know he's got a fast car and uh, we know he knows how to get to the front. So winning that first race can really be a big plus for you for the rest of the speed weeks. Now, when the last new car came out, it seemed like Hendrick Motorsports was the first organization to get their arms around it and start really winning races with it. Now we got another new car. Uh, you guys have some of the smartest people in the business working at Hendrick Motorsports. How do you feel you've grasped this new car so far? Well, I think that uh, we're always learning at Hendrick Motorsports. They're always trying to uncover uh, you know, the next greatest thing and the next advantage. Uh, and that was uh, one of the things that kept me excited about 2013 when we got this, when we, when we found out we we're going to have a new car and everybody's going to have to sort of reset on their knowledge and everything. I was more excited because I'm with Hendrick Motorsports and they are the, the most innovative organization. They do have the, the brightest guys working there and they do have the hardest workers there. So I know when it comes to Understanding this car, evaluating it, and finding out what makes it work, we're going to be one of the organizations that make that happen first. So uh, I'm going to be able to be one of the drivers that gets to reap that reward, and I'm excited about that. Well, Dale, thanks for your time. We yep. appreciate it. Best of luck this yes, season. And uh, Danielle, they won last year. You can look for this team to be a championship contender because that's their goal this time around. Thanks so much, JR. The sand is slipping through the hourglass at Daytona, but there's still time to ask Kevin Harvick about his final season with the only team he's ever known. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Hunt, presented tonight by Mobile One. Media Day means we are oh so close to racing. As winner of the 2009 and 2010 shootouts, Kevin Harvick is in the show Saturday night. And when he straps into that 29 car for Richard Childress Racing, it will be the start of his final season with the only team he's ever known. Late last year, Kevin felt he'd be more happy at Stuart Haas Racing and says that's where he's headed in 2014. He's standing by now with John Roberts in Daytona. Danielle, Kevin Harvick joins us now, and Kevin, your boss, Richard Childress, is, is one to be known to make a change when it needs to be made. Over the years with your career with him, that you guys have changed a lot of things around. What's new for this year as far as personnel goes with your team? Well, we don't really have a lot of changes from the end of last year. Obviously, uh, Gil Martin's come back over to, uh, to crew chief the car, and most every guy on the team is the same, I think, except for one or two. So 
when you have that consistency uh, bleed over from, from year to year, obviously you can, you can work on other things, and hopefully we can come out of the gate strong. This is probably the easiest question to ask, but one of the hardest to answer. <laughs> you guys are always competing for a championship, but it seems you come up a little short each year. But, but th these are different things, right? It's a moving target. Yeah, and that's what I, I told somebody earlier. The, the hard thing is to have the consistency that we're used to having, which we didn't have last year, the performance that you need in the cars to, to win races and the racing luck all line up over the last 10 weeks of the season so we just uh, we've had some great seasons and, and come up short at the end and, and uh, you know we have to have those great seasons but we also have to have all three of those things come together during the chase and people like to use the word distraction a lot going into this year there's certainly going to be distractions around your future for 2014 is it difficult easy for a driver and a team to put that sort of thing behind them when it comes to competing well, I think I think for my team, um, you know, I, I think that, that they should be able to put the distractions behind them because they, they shouldn't have to deal with them. Um, you know, that, that should be the responsibility of, of myself and, and Richard. And, and we've already got through the, the, the blunt of, um, you know, knowing that it's my last year at RCR. So I think as, as we move forward, um, you know, I think as, as we just kind of answer the questions and, and go perform on the racetrack, I think you'll see a lot of that go away. And, and, and really, um, as we go towards the end of the year, you, you want to have uh, people look at the year and say, man, they handled that like professionals and, and they've done a good job and, and build a little character in ourselves. Now, you've driven a couple different generations of race cars and many different types of race cars. Yeah, what few. do you think about this new one? <laughs> yeah, a few in your day. Yeah, yeah. so it's, um, you know, the, the car looks great. And, and the biggest thing that I like about it is the fans love the way that it looks and the manufacturers are, are really involved. And hopefully we can get back to that win on Sunday, sell on Monday motto and, and really keep the manufacturers happy. Kevin, thanks a lot. We appreciate your time. No Best problem. of luck this Thank year. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Steve, he's been in victory lane after a Daytona 500 before. What a great way for him to start out this season by doing it again. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I agree with Kevin Harvick. Everybody's professional there yes. on that RCR team. No, no question about it. But I've heard people say, boy, he better get off to a good start or it could become a distraction. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll be a distraction. Um, if Kevin Harvick and Richard Childress were ever going to be dis distracted, I think it was when Kevin first went there. He went into that ride under the circumstances that we know he, he ended up there. And they handled the, his entry into cup racing incredibly professional. They, they with respect, the, the whole thing, everything they did after Earnhardt's accident was totally first class. And I think you'll see that on the way out. These guys have been together 12 years, 19 wins. This is going to be, when you look at Kevin's record book, this is going to be where he spent the majority of his career. And this is going to be a big part of it. So I think his respect for Richard, what Kevin can do in a race car, I think it will show up this year. And I do believe this. The Childress organization is notorious for coming off really bad years or really flat years with really great years. So I look at Kevin and all those guys over there. Burton, Paul Menard is having big years over there, but Kevin going out on a high note. Yeah, I think it's time for Kevin Harvick to make a change because even though he made the chase, won Phoenix last year, I think over the last few years he's just not been happy at Richard Childress Racing. Dale Earnhardt Jr. led the points after winning at Michigan, heading into Pocono, um, had the, uh, the health scare with a concussion, but everything I saw suggests that he feels like he can be a player. Well, and here's why I think he will be a player. You know, nobody's probably more happier than in that garage area to see Gen 5, the COT, go away <laughs> than Dale Earnhardt Jr. because he came on the circuit full-time in 2000. And if you look at his first seven years, he won 17 races. In 2003, he finished third in the points. 2004, he won six races. And then five and a half years ago, roughly, along came the COT. He's only won two races. This, the COT just gave him a false feel in that race car, and he never could get his arms around what it was doing, and then, in essence, he couldn't transfer yeah. that information, I think, to his crew chief. Now, every driver here loves downforce. I think this Gen 6 car, with the downforce it's going to have, I think it's going to play right into Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s wheelhouse. Yeah, Kyle, I, I agree with that. Interesting. Steve Letarte said, everybody gives me credit for keeping Dale Earnhardt Jr. pumped up. 
he keeps me pumped up, and that's the inner workings of a race team that people never see. Yeah, it is. But but I think it started with Steve Letarte. It started with Steve Letarte pumping Junior up, and Junior said, oh, I see how this works. Now I'll pump you back up, and I'll talk good about the team, and I'll be there with them. So I think they feed off each other, and I think Junior, I think Steve's done a great job with him. Yeah, contrary to what people may believe, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is just like his dad, Dale Earnhardt Sr. He needs a cheerleader. Yeah. He needs to feel like someone is really behind him and cheering him on. It's going to be an interesting season for the 88 team. New car, new name, new rules, new winner. We'll tell you who it's going to be. We're crunching the unlimited numbers. That's next. Welcome back. The big old hub is rolling, and it's time to crunch some numbers on this weekend's Sprint Unlimited. In search for all things unlimited, the vast reaches of space come to mind, the ever-moving hand of time, and, of course, love. This year, we lose the rough shootout moniker in favor of unlimited thrills. But who will Cupid favor this weekend? This is it, boys. Can you feel the love? With all the fan choice this year, even the drivers won't know their starting spot. So where do we begin? How about the most recent winners? Over the past four years, these drivers have combined to lead a whopping five laps. So don't look for one guy to dominate. Kevin Harvick comes from the rear to the front. He will win the Budweiser shootout. In 2009 and 2010, Kevin Harvick felt the love, but was seventh in 2011 and crashed out last year. You're on fire, Kevin. Yeah, get out of that thing, man. Yeah. Still, four top fives and eight starts is pretty sweet. The last two winners share a name and love. Brotherly love. The Bush brothers wooed the last two. Here they come. Three wide to the stripe, and the winner is. Three wide. Kurt Bush has won the Budweiser shootout. Smoke versus Wild Thing to the line. He got it. He got it. Wild Thing wins. So, furniture or chocolate this Valentine's Day? Point Kyle. But as suitors go, the Unlimited provides the best of the best or almost. Notably absent last year's champ Brad Keselowski and second in points Clint Boyer, a first ever for the Unlimited. But plenty of guys have their eyes on the prize. With two wins and seven top tens and 12 starts, Junior has the numbers. And there's trouble. Dale Earnhardt Jr. gets a piece of it. He crashed out in three of the last four, but maybe this year he returns the love to Junior Nation. And who could forget the heartbreaker, the playboy race car driver single and experienced yep 13 unlimited starts he scored three times and top fives 69 percent of the time so variables aside we give tony the best shot but the real winner the real winner is you the fans how can it not be a win an aggressive non-points race where you get to be the promoter crew chief and race director helping make the calls in the first race of the 2013 speed season in the sport we all love go nascar coming up next the young gun joey logano sits down with our john roberts in daytona about his new ride at penske racing stay with us <laughs> for the year. Joey Logano won nine times in the Nationwide Series last year, but when Matt Kenseth came over to Joe Gibbs Racing, Joey Logano had to find a ride and find one he did. He'll be going to Penske Racing with new teammate Brad Keselowski. Here's, uh, here he is with John Roberts.
Steve, thanks a lot. One of the greatest things about a new season is you see new faces in different places. And one of those drivers who has a new ride and a new suit, which, by the way, Joey Logano looks very good, is Mr. Logano himself. Joey, on the off season, you might uh, must have had a lot of getting to know with uh, getting to know you with the uh, Penske organization. How's it going so far? Yes, it's been very busy. Lots of stuff going on. Um, obviously, getting to know everybody, like you said. Um, you know, obviously with Todd Gordon, my whole 22 Shell Pennzoil team, uh, and then how Penske, the organization works, you know, how um, how the system works, how they build cars, and, um, you know, trying to remember names, that's the hardest part. But um, it's been a lot of fun. I've, uh, you know, they've involved me a lot on what's going on. Um, getting to know Roger has been really cool. Um, obviously, working with Brad has been, uh, uh, you know, a huge gain. I feel like we've been working together really well, and we can um, build the company even better than what it is, which is uh, pretty, pretty good after seeing what they've done last year so um, just hoping to get better got to keep working one of the best things for a competitor sometimes is a fresh start but the only thing better than that is having a fresh start with one of the top organizations in your sport yeah it um, that stars aligned perfectly for this one for sure and uh, um, I can't wait to get out there I feel like we're ready to go out there and um, I didn't feel that way until about a week ago uh, we got back from testing down here in Disney and uh, you know we had a good debrief and it's like okay I think we're ready now. I feel like uh, you know, we're prepared. We, uh, I think, you know, Todd and I are really communicating well. So I feel like, okay, we're, we're ready to go to Daytona and compete for wins. Knowing there's still going to be a learning curve. There's still going to be, you know, we haven't raced yet. But there's little things like that are going to come up as we go. So that's what makes it important to see that we're in the Sprint Unlimited, um, to go out there, work with each other um, as a team. Crew chief, new spotter. Um, new driver, you know, we're all working together. So that's a big race for us there, like a preseason football game. It's a preseason race. I, I look at it that way. Um, and also we're going out there to win the thing. So have some fun <laughs> with that too. So, um, and also you're working with the new generation six car. So you, there's so many new things going on right now. We need a 30 minute show yeah, for that. So. Exactly. Yeah. So, Joey, was it tough for you? It seemed like over the past couple of years, at any time a high-level driver was up at the end of his contract, said, oh, he's going to go to the 20 car. He's going to go to the 20 car. Was it difficult for you to put that out of your mind and, and continue to race that, in that car? Um, yeah, at times it is. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you about that. But uh, at the same time, you know, you've, you learn to focus in and on what really counts. You know, rumors are rumors. 90% of the time, they're not true. Um, so I, I just focus in on what I know I can do and go out there and race and I can't really control what everyone else is thinking or saying by just showing my actions and go out there and win. That's basically all you can do. Well, Joey, best of luck in this new season. We appreciate your Thank time. You. And go get them out appreciate there. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right, Steve, that's Joey Logano. Got a new ride, a new suit, and a new outlook on his racing life. Thank you, Johnny. Matt Clark back with us. I'm going to be really excited to watch this, this combination because yeah. Brad Keselowski said on the hub the day after he won the championship that he thrives on teamwork. The more he gave back, right. the more he got. And I think that's really going to help Joey Logano. Well, let's face it. That was lacking on the 22 car last year. They faced a lot of issues. Todd Gordon did a great job of holding that ship together. They changed drivers. We saw a lot of drama as it unfolded. But this is a fresh start for them. You and I caught up with Joey and Todd at the test yeah. at Charlotte. And Joey was really almost relieved. He was relaxed. And I think he's excited to be in that ride with Roger Penske, Todd Gordon, the 22 car. And honestly, he needed change, Steve. He needed to be in a new environment. He's only, what, 22, 23 years old? We look at Matt Kenseth. We're projecting Matt Kenseth. But Matt is, what, 15, 16, 17 years older than yeah. him? So, look, guys, Joey's still young. He's got room to grow. You heard him say, hey, I'm learning, Todd. So, Look, I think good things are going to come out of that Penske camp. And I think it's helpful for Joey Logano, too, to unburden himself from the massive expectations that were placed at his feet when he was. No fault to Joe Gibbs Racing, but people expected a lot out of him. Right. Well, and Joe signed an up-and-coming guy in Joey yep. Logano. So great job by Joe Gibbs. Got him in the sport. But you know what? It's like the rookie thing. You put so much on him. He had the weight. He... he filled in. He took Tony Stewart's ride. Think about that. Yeah. All right. Just like, just like, uh, I almost called him Stenica. Just <laughs> like Stenhouse is taking the ride for Matt Kenseth. It's yeah. a huge burden and you got to carry it. I think him being out from under that at Penske is going to be very good for him. It's going to be exciting to watch. No question. Thanks, Matt. Well, our guys from here in Daytona will wrap up media, media day coming up next.
McReynolds, Kyle Petty back with us here in Daytona. 55th running of the Daytona 500. How many days away? Uh, it would be nine. Thank now. you. Thank Ooh. you, sir. Uh, if we had an unofficial or an official tally of the word excited being used today in uh, yeah. on media day, it would be astronomical. But the point is, we have a brand new season. Everybody's in first place, and we have a brand new race car, which, to this point, Kyle, seems like the drivers like. Yeah, and, and you know, drivers dread media day, and, and they'll tell yes. you, you know, you come down here, you put your uniform on, you stand over there, you talk to everybody, you have your photo taken, all that stuff, but there was excitement, and there has been excitement since these guys first tested this Gen 6 at Charlotte, then come, came here and tested, went back to Charlotte, there's been that excitement, and it's building, and it builds every day, and I think we saw it in the media tent. I don't care whether what type of driver, whether you're a Craftsman Truck Series driver, nationwide driver, they're excited to see what this car is going to do. The guys that are driving and working on this car are as excited as they've ever been. We heard Larry talk about Junior. He's excited. So I, I think a lot of times you give it lip service when you're over there in the tent. This time you could feel it. But it's always interesting to watch Media Day. It's like the first day of school. Oh, Everybody's yeah. got their new uniforms on. Yeah. You've seen people you hadn't seen, seen in three months. But I, I just think the fact that we had those 19 teams Teams. It's in the Sprint Unlimited race. They went through inspection today. 45 teams for the Daytona 500 tomorrow. And finally, after almost two years of development, 14 months of on-track testing, all the work over the winter, tomorrow night at 5 p.m. on speed, we're going to see Sprint Unlimited practice. And then two nights from right now, we're finally going to see the first race of 2013. And I think everybody's ready to race. It's like, you know what? We've worked, we've worked, we've worked. Let's get out on the racetrack and see what we've got right it, now. It is like the first day of school. Boyfriends and girlfriends got to see each other again <laughs> over there. So that is cool. Uh, on Valentine's Day. <laughs> and, and briefly, guys, important year also for the auto manufacturer. Yes, it is. Rebranding of these cars. Re when you see the car, you know it's a Toyota. You know it's a Ford. You know it's a Chevy. You know what's out there. That's exciting. Yeah, I think the racing's going to be better. But you know what? It was pretty good the way it was, but even if the racing is the same, this race car just looks like a great, good-looking race car. Well, we're ready to go racing. Thanks for being with us. Daniel Trotter will wrap up the hub right after this. NASCAR Race Hub is presented by Mobile One, the official motor oil of NASCAR. Mobile One, and brought to you in part by the all-new Ford Fusion. Go further. Next week on NASCAR Race Hub, we'll have a full review of the beginnings of Speed Weeks in Daytona, including highlights and reaction from the Sprint Unlimited and Daytona 500 qualifying. RCR Nationwide Series driver Brian Scott will be in the hub on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, we'll be sure to bring you the latest from two 500 practice sessions. Tomorrow, we have you covered live coverage at the track, part of the Fox Sports family's 11 straight days of Speed Week coverage. There's the schedule. Join me and the gang on NASCAR Live at 4 p.m. Eastern, followed by Unlimited Practice at 5, another edition of NASCAR Live at 6, which leads us to final practice for, you, for the Unlimited at 6.30. Don't forget Speed Center. They're wrapping up the day at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Well, Monday on Speed, it's an hour-long special any NASCAR fan shouldn't miss. Richard Petty has been a fixture in this sport since the late 1950s. It's a story of triumph and tragedy. From his record seven cup championships to the loss of his grandson, Adam, the King has remained in the sport now as a team owner, and his legions of fans are thankful. Here's a preview. Richard Petty is a simple man with small-town roots who grew to become an American legend. One of the great masters of the sport. A legend in his own time. They don't perceive you being separated from them. The fame that came with the petty name may have been a way of life, but that didn't mean it had to be the family's way of living. We tried to teach the kids we wasn't nothing special. If mama said or daddy said, come in here and do this, you just did it. I disciplined. My mom wore my butt out. But I never remember the king spanking me. But in every royal family, there are stories of heartbreak. When you take something away from somebody else, especially their life, it's got to affect you a whole lot. They keep thinking what if or what could have been or what might have been, and you just go crazy. But through it all, Richard Petty is held strong, and he keeps on racing. Richard Petty, without racing, We'd be reading about him in the paper that he passed away because that's who he is. As long as I can go, I'll be there.
You don't want to miss that. Thanks so much for watching this special two-hour edition of NASCAR Race Hub. And we're not only on air for the next 11 days, but we're also always online. You can go to speed.com slash racehub, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at Racehub. That about does it. I'm about to hop a plane, head down to the beach, and I'll see you tomorrow. We hope you join us then. It's almost time to go racing. I'll see you soon.